This is where a young reporter named Bob Woodward met in the middle of the night with his confidential source, a man who came to be known everywhere as Deep Throat. Almost no one has known the location of this garage, and that's just one of the secrets that Bob Woodward kept. Woodward also promised to keep Deep Throat's name a secret as well, and he honored that promise for more than 30 years. Finally released from his obligation, he'll tell us the whole story of his friend, Deep Throat. When they were meeting here, America was in turmoil, not only about Watergate, but about Vietnam. There were violent anti-war protests. George McGovern running for president from the left, George Wallace running from the hard right, and in the White House, a president who was well known for his ruthless use of political power and for his paranoia. That's what led to an early morning burglary arrest at the Watergate complex. And that's where our story begins. It was once dismissed by the White House as a third-rate burglary. And when it occurred, the story was assigned to a Washington Post police report. Sarmat might seem like an ordinary ICBM, but its range is much longer. The legendary Topol M missiles can only take the shortest route through the ABM systems. Sarmat can travel via the North or the South Pole, where there's no missile shield, and it will still hit its target. But most importantly, Sarmat is a heavy missile capable of carrying more than 20 warheads. That's five times more than previous generation missiles. One of the burglars was this man, James McCord. And the judge asked, you know, where do you guys work? Where do you come from? Where do you come from? And finally, uh, James McCord whispered something. The judge said, speak up. And McCord said uh, he had worked at the CIA. And that was just like a 10,000 volt jolt. Woodward instantly realized lots of things about this burglary didn't add up. It happened at the Democratic National Headquarters in the Watergate office complex. The five burglars not only wore business suits, they had electronic bugging equipment, and they carried cash, about $2,300, some of it in sequentially numbered $100 bills. Woodward had no way to know that this burglary was just an early warning sign of what would later be famously called a cancer on the presidency, a culture of lawlessness so pervasive it was hard for most Americans to grasp. G. Gordon Liddy was part of that culture. He was prosecuted for supervising the Watergate burglars. I went home and uh, went into my bedroom and Mrs. Liddy woke up and she said, is everything okay? And I said, no, I think I'm gonna go to jail. John Dean was part of it. He was White House counsel. I, in effect, became the desk officer of the cover-up. Others, now dead, were part of it as well. Chief of Staff Bob Haldeman, Chief Domestic Advisor John Ehrlichman, Attorney General John Mitchell. Together, they would do anything to protect the imperial presidency of Richard Nixon, presidential historian Michael Beschloss. And his worldview was, I, the president, I'm surrounded by enemies, and I have got to keep them at bay and ultimately destroy them. The president's man had concocted elaborate and often illegal plans to destroy Nixon's enemies, real and imagined. The protesters in the streets who opposed the war in Vietnam and marched on the White House by the hundreds of thousands, they were enemies. Charles Colson was special counsel to the president. You go down in the basement of the old executive office building and there's uh, troops from the 82nd Airborne in camouflage gear lying on the floor to defend the White House if necessary. I felt like I was in a banana republic. And many times through that period, I felt like this is, this is like warfare. The news media, printing secret government documents, prying into places Nixon didn't want them to go, they were enemies, especially the Washington Post. Several Nixon documents. speechwriter, Pat Buchanan. The Post was pretty much, as an institution, at the top of Nixon's enemies list. And uh, we were at the top of the Washington Post's enemies list. And finally, Nixon's political opponents, the Democrats campaigning against his reelection in 1972, were very much on the enemies list. I was recruited to develop a fully comprehensive offensive and defensive political intelligence program. The president's perceived enemies had been targeted for dirty tricks, wiretaps, break-ins. But in June of 1972, that was a secret. For reporters covering the Watergate burglary, 
the true scope of what they were dealing with came out slowly, piece by piece. The Associated Press found out that James McCord, the head burglar, had been the head of security for the CIA for years, but more importantly was head of security for the Nixon re-election committee. A couple of days later, the Washington Post police reporter found another key to the mystery. The address books of two of the burglars had these entries, WH-H Hunt and W House Howard Hunt. And, you know, what does that mean? So I called Hunt and he slammed down the phone and had a certain I am packing my bags quality to his voice, which tells you something's up, but I didn't know what. So Woodward turned to a trusted source in a high place, a source he had been cultivating for two years, who demanded that he never be quoted or named. And what did he say? He first uh, seemed very nervous oddly enough, because he was not a nervous man. I said, you know, that, look, anyone can have your name in their address book. What does it mean? And he gave me the first key piece of information saying, don't worry, Howard Hunt is involved, and this is serious. Hunt worked part-time for Charles Colson, a key aide to Richard Nixon. It was the first White House connection Woodward wasn't working this story alone. From the beginning, his partner was another young reporter, Carl Bernstein. They both quickly realized that the White House connection was a major development. It was unprecedented, and obviously we, we were a little awestruck, and it, it gave us a special sense of responsibility. They knew the FBI was also investigating. What they didn't know was that the White House was trying to limit that investigation. Then White House counsel John Dean. One of the first things we did after the Watergate break-in, and one of our concerns was, was where this investigation would go. And we were very concerned about that, that the investigation be very limited. In fact, Dean himself was assigned to sit in as the FBI grilled witnesses about the burglary. John Dean was sent in to be involved in a lot of the interrogations, both so that Nixon would know what was going on, and also to intimidate those who were trying to find out information. It would be learned only later from the Nixon White House tapes that the president himself ordered his chief of staff, Bob Haldeman, to cover up the reasons for the Watergate burglary, to tell the FBI, which was investigating, to back off. But Woodward's secret source encouraged the young reporter to press on. Keep going, young man. There is a lot here. Clearly, this has gone from uh, two or three on the Richter scale to 100. Talking about Mitchell being involved. Yep. In his so notes on his secret source, which he's operation, never shown before, Howard Hunt Woodward referred to him as X this is in or MF, my right. friend. And but Howard Simons, one of Bob's bosses, came up with a more colorful name. Deep throat, because at this point, the managing editor had given him that very unfortunate name, uh, kind of by accident, it just kind of came out because it was on deep background. Deep Throat was the title of a very popular and very pornographic film released in 1972. And he said Deep Throat, and so that's the way the editors referred to him. The post editors were anxious about the Watergate stories. This was high stakes journalism, going after the White House. Woodward and Bernstein were relatively low-level staffers. Federal prosecutors on the case didn't seem to be finding any larger conspiracy. And Nixon loyalists denied every story, furiously attacking the Post day in and day out. It's my view that this uh, matter has reached the level of unbelievable absurdity. Ben Bradley was executive editor of the Washington Post. Those guys were, were really uh, tough against us. Bob Dole, that nice, nice man, was the chairman of the Republican committee, and he was making uh, speeches that would make my daughter cry at night. The reporters could feel the pressure building, and so could Deep Throat. He told Woodward they both had to be extremely cautious that they should never talk on the telephone, and Deep Throat proposed an elaborate clandestine scheme for their face-to-face -face meetings. If Woodward wanted a meeting, 
he needed to move a flower pot with a red flag on the balcony of his apartment. If Deep Throat wanted to meet, he would draw a clock on page 20 of the New York Times delivered each day to Woodward's apartment. Deep Throat began insisting on meeting at 2 a.m. in a parking garage in Roslyn, Virginia, just across the Potomac River from Washington. He ordered Woodward to change cabs on his way here to walk the last several blocks to make sure that he wasn't being tailed. Woodward had never disclosed the exact location, never taken anyone there until he took us. But you really get to this point, you know, is, uh, is he here? And, and, I then, and then you come, and then you say something. And it's kind of like the oracle has come down. At any point do you say to yourself, Woodward, what the hell have I got myself into here? Yeah, all the time, but you want the information. You know this is a guy who can help you uh, like no one else. And in one of the first of those garage meetings, October 9th, 1972, almost four months after the Watergate burglary, Deep Throat made a promise. I have the notes that I typed that night, and the first line is him saying, there is a way to untie the Watergate knot. It was very reassuring to you, wasn't it, to know that you had this guy who said, you're on the right track, but maybe you ought to think about going in this direction. It would have been more reassuring if I could get Woodward to see him more. I can't tell you how many times I said to Bob, I said, call that guy. And Woodward said, I can't get him, I can't get him. Said, Move the damn flower pot. <laughs> Woodward and Bernstein had uncovered a secret slush fund, cash from political donors that was used to finance the burglary, cash controlled by the most powerful of the president's men. The stakes are so, getting so high. We're writing about higher ups in the Nixon administration, and we're saying all these other people are involved, or might be. Woodward's source confirmed one man who controlled the secret fund was John Mitchell. Here is the former attorney general of the United States, the chairman of the committee to reelect the president. It doesn't get any bigger than this. That's right. And we are saying he controlled the secret fund that financed Watergate and other activities. Those other activities included dirty tricks against Democratic presidential candidates. One was a letter that embarrassed candidate Edmund Muskie, a letter which claimed Muskie condoned the use of an ethnic slur, a letter which was in fact written by a Nixon staffer as a dirty trick. And G. Gordon Liddy had an elaborate plan he called Operation Gemstone, which called for illegal spying on Democrats. One of the things that uh, we were equipped to do was to uh, follow the aircraft that would be transporting the Democratic nominee. And as he would use the uh, telephone or whatever, to uh, talk back down to the ground, we could intercept that. Right after the Watergate burglary, Liddy had destroyed evidence of these secret dealings, even some of the cash from the slush fund. We had all kinds of uh, uh, plans and charts, and uh, we even had uh, some $100 bills, and I checked through those, and 13 of them were uh, sequential, uh, you know, they were brand new, and they were sequentially uh, serial numbered. And I knew that was dangerous, so I took those 13 only and put them between two pieces of white paper so no one would see what I was doing, and I shredded those too. But despite the cover-up, Woodward and Bernstein, with the help of Deep Throat and other sources, finally were putting the puzzle together, tying the Watergate burglary to the broader Dirty Tricks campaign. Then, at another meeting in the garage, Deep Throat told Woodward the conspiracy reached right into the president's inner circle. He said it was a Haldeman operation. And so the White House chief of staff ran it all, knew about it. It was his operation. In and out of the Oval Office all day long. Exactly. About that time, it dawned on them that the conspiracy could involve the president himself. You're having a little meeting up in the Washington Post. Yeah, the, the little uh, cafeteria where they uh, have the worst coffee in America. And I pressed the button for this awful coffee in the machine, and I said, felt this chill. I remember it to this day. 
I turned around to Woodward and I said, oh my God, this president is going to be impeached. I realized this was no flight of fancy and said, you're right. And we paused and kind of held the moment and I said, we can never say that in this newsroom, ever because people would think we had some agenda or there was a political motive in all of this. They were choosing every word so carefully, but there was a problem. Nobody's paying attention. No one's paying attention. The rest of the press is not picking it up very much. Public is not responding to it. He has a triumphant second inaugural, Richard Nixon does. Triumphant in a way, you don't get a victory like he got. He murdered George McGovern. The United States. Less than five months after the Watergate break-in, Richard Nixon won re-election with 61% of the vote, one of the biggest landslides in presidential history. Deep Throat had promised to help untie the Watergate knot, but so far, it was holding fast. I have never heard or seen such outrageous, vicious, distorted reporting in 27 years of public life. And President Richard Nixon, for that. having creamed George McGovern at the polls, was now promising to destroy the Washington Post. They don't really realize how rough I play, but when I start, I will tell them I have about it. When a newspaper published an article that Nixon did not like, he would say, set the IRS on them. When a TV network or a TV station put on a story that Nixon did not like, he would say, Let's look into antitrust measures against that company or perhaps use the Federal Communications Commission to intimidate them. Soon after Nixon was re-elected, complaints were filed with the FCC about the Washington Post ownership of two television stations in Florida. But Woodward and Bernstein were barely aware of the financial pressure on their employer. Carl and I were living in a bubble. We were protected by Ben Bradley and Catherine Graham, who owned and was publisher of the Washington Post. They just said, go get it, go do it. Were there nights when you went home and thought, man, I've invested a lot in these two young guys and um, anonymous sources, people who I don't know? Well, we had a lot riding on this story, especially after Nixon was reelected with this huge majority and uh, it uh, tended to disappear off, the, off of the newspapers. Television was doing very, very little with it. Catherine used to come down and say, you know, God, I hope you, you sure we're right. The late owner and publisher, Catherine Graham in particular, knew what Watergate coverage was costing her paper, but Woodward says she never wavered. Just the other day, somebody who headed uh, automotive advertising for the Washington Post at this time said, you know, there was a meeting in the fall of 72 where we all had to report to Catherine Graham about advertising. People were mad about our Watergate coverage. And he said, I had to look Catherine Graham in the eye and say, I have bad news. We've lost $7 million in automotive advertising. And you know what she said? Thank God we can afford it. One thing that reassured all of them was Deep Throat. But Deep Throat's identity was so secret, Woodward's bosses were not aware of who it was. There's been a big debate in our profession about the use of sources recently. Yes. Again. Yeah. And whether they should be tightened up, uh, a greater identification of them, higher standards. Do you agree with that? Sure, I do. But I, but I'm, I don't believe in banning anonymous sources. Part of the campaign of those who seek to undermine the press is based on saying, oh, it's anonymous sources. But basically, the great information that we know about our time has come from anonymous sources. Bob Woodward began to cultivate the most famous anonymous source in history before he was even a reporter. It was 1970. Woodward was finishing a tour in the US Navy. He was delivering classified documents to the Nixon White House. As Woodward sat in a small waiting area outside the Situation Room, a tall, distinguished-looking older man sat down beside him. Woodward started to talk and talk. He tells the story in his new book, The Secret Man. And you pour your heart out to him. You're a needy young man. I was adrift. I had no idea what the, the future was. And here was a moment, like two passengers on this airplane, kind of condemned to, 
to be together because he was waiting to see somebody, and so it was 45 minutes or an hour. It was a chance encounter that would change history. Woodward's captive listener turned out to be a top man at the FBI, an agency that at the time had an aura of invincible power and prestige. Journalist and FBI historian Ron Kessler. These were the you know cowboys who always got their man and uh, never did anything wrong. If they did do anything wrong, it was totally covered up and never appeared in the press. Woodward's acquaintance was named W. Mark Felt. He was this kind of flamboyant character, a G-man through and through. Did that appeal to you at that time? Well, it was his reserve and that sense of here's somebody who's on the inside of the secrets, uh, somebody who's used to giving orders uh, and having them obeyed. Uh, you know, a Hoover man through and through. A Hoover man, as in J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI's director for life. Hoover had ruled the Bureau for an astonishing 46 years. In fact, you know, Hoover in many ways was more powerful than presidents. I mean, here's a guy who had outlasted all these presidents, who had the power to do almost anything, wiretap, uh, break in, who had files on everybody that everyone was afraid of. Hoover relentlessly dug dirt on politicians. He used it ruthlessly to maintain his power. Hoover would, in effect, blackmail members of Congress, presidents, with material from his files. He would simply go to President Nixon or President Johnson or President Kennedy and say, you know, we found out this about your girlfriend, of course we won't say anything, and that alone was enough to be uh, implicit blackmail. Hoover had some kind of dirt on Nixon, and Nixon didn't want to mess with Hoover. Mark Felt was Hoover's protege. He had joined the FBI during World War II, when the Bureau's focus was on counterintelligence, hunting German spies. Now, 30 years later, he was at Hoover's right hand, and he knew many of the FBI's secrets. Mark Felt was, you know, a very, very excellent agent, very smart. He was a lawyer, uh, and he was also very adept at uh, manipulating Hoover by flattering him. That was very, very important in the FBI, uh, how to flatter Hoover. Nixon White House operative Gordon Liddy, a former FBI agent, has reason to dislike Felt now, but he claims even then Felt had a reputation. He was, in FBI slang of the time, a torpedo. What that meant was he was only too happy to advance his career at the expense of yours. Nixon's White House counsel, now, John Dean, actually met Felt. The Mark Felt I talked to was a consummate FBI professional. He was the image that Hoover wanted as the ideal agent. He was trim. He was always immaculately dressed. He was uh, articulate. At that first chance meeting in the White House, Woodward must have made a very good impression. Felt gave him his direct telephone number at the FBI. You write in your book, the hook was set. Yeah. That sounds like you were using him. Yes, and uh, I was kind of uh, his career counselor. I mean, I called him my friend, but he was 25, 30 years older, and he was kind of like an extra father. The extra father notion. That's a pretty strong relationship. It is, yeah. You know that the real and amateur psychologists out there watching all of this are going to be intrigued by how that relationship developed. Yes, and I share the intrigue. One piece of advice his extra father gave him was to pursue a career that he loved. But when Woodward left the Navy and decided he loved journalism, Mark felt was not happy. The FBI didn't have the highest view of the American press at the time. It was a chill. And then I said, now you can help me on stories. And you, if you ever saw ice, uh, on someone's face, he just no response. But Bob, looking back at that time, how young you were and how untested you were and how low your station was in journalistic life and you're asking the senior member of the FBI, are you kind of amused <laughs> by your aggressiveness now? No, I guess I'm not because I think one of the mistakes we make in journalism is we don't ask. Woodward talked his way into a two-week tryout at the Washington Post even though he had no newspaper experience at all. And you failed? Failed miserably. It wasn't just a failure, it was a total wipeout. A kind of a humiliation. Yeah, that's right. Did you share all that with Mark Feld at the time? In general, in general. Woodward then found a job at a small weekly paper in nearby Rockville, Maryland. 
One of his first stories ran under the headline, Rockville Council Bugged. It was not a foreshadowing of Watergate. It was about cockroaches. But soon Woodward broke more significant stories. The Washington Post took notice and hired him back. And he continued to see the FBI man, Mark Felt. I went out to his house a couple of times, met his wife. Did you go out for dinner? Or no, just uh, sit around? Show up on the doorstep. Sunday Unannounced? After, Sunday afternoon, yeah. Looking for information or for friendship? Great question, and it's, the answer is both. Uh, uh, but probably uh, information, because this is 19, uh, late 71, early 72, really dark period in America. All kinds of things are going on. Uh, and this is a guy, God knows what he knows. It was during this dark time that the Nixon White House decided it was at war, not just in Vietnam, but at home as well. Well, the Nixon administration uh, said, OK, we've, we've got, in effect, sort of a civil war going on here. And we're either going to win this war or lose this war. And we had no intention of losing that war. And Nixon's men showed just how far they would go to win during the summer of 1971 when the New York Times and the Washington Post published the Pentagon Papers, a secret history of the Vietnam War prepared by the Defense Department, never intended for public consumption, but leaked to the newspapers. The Pentagon Papers case brought together so many of Nixon's enemies, the anti-war movement, the media, Democrats, and a leaker on the inside, a former Pentagon analyst named Daniel Ellsberg. Nixon pounded the table and he said, Bob Holloman, I've told you before, I want a team of men in here who can break in and get those documents back when they've been stolen from us. And Holloman says, yes, sir. That led to the hiring of uh, Howard Hunt and Gordon Liddy, who were two, uh, a very combustible mix of people with romantic visions, uh, spy backgrounds. Nixon advisor Charles Colson later went to prison for his role in organizing the White House plumbers, a team of operatives who would stop leaks at any cost. Hunt and Liddy personally went after the leaker, Daniel Ellsberg. Well, it entailed uh, breaking into the office of the psychiatrist of Daniel Ellsberg because of the things to which he had access and their extraordinary importance for national security. We needed to know what he had and what he intended to do with it. They had decided that in the name of national security, they were allowed to break the law and their boss, Richard Nixon, went even further. The most revealing thing that Richard Nixon, in my mind, ever said in his whole life was in 1977, he gave an interview in which he said, if a president says to do something, that means it is not illegal. That was a window into the guy's soul. Even as the president's men were secretly crossing the line, Mark Felt began to cross a line of his own. He began to leak to Bob Woodward. And he's surprisingly forthcoming. Yeah, he is. Woodward promised to keep Felt's identity secret, and Felt revealed key information, a bribe taken by Vice President Spiro Agnew, background on Arthur Bremer, who shot and gravely wounded arch-conservative presidential candidate George Wallace. Those were important tips, but also tips that in one way or the other served the interest of the FBI. Do you ever talk about the conditions of your professional relationship as opposed to your personal relationship? No, you never sit down and have those conversations with people. Because you're worried about uh, where it may lead. Yes, ex exactly. I mean, this is, uh, we use people, but remember, he was uh, trained by Hoover. And uh, no one used the press more effectively than J. Edgar Hoover. But that's also a peril for you. You could be used by the number two man in the FBI. Amen. It's a symbiotic relationship. That's right, and a dangerous one. But there was something else working besides mutual self-interest. In an era that pitted the media against government, the young against the old, somehow the 20-something reporter and the veteran G-man trusted each other. You think he saw you as a bright, upstanding young man just out of the Navy, probably shares my values, and that was maybe part of the reason for the bond that he quickly established? There's a tendency to remember people in the role they have when you meet them. And I was wearing that Navy uniform. I was as buttoned down as he was. And calling him sir. Calling him sir. As Woodward's career was just beginning to take off, 
Mark Felt was going through his own career crisis. In May of 1972, his mentor and his idol, J. Edgar Hoover, died. Felt thought he deserved to be named Hoover's successor. But Nixon wanted his own man, his own pipeline into the FBI. He named L. Patrick Gray, a little-known Nixon loyalist without many distinguishing credentials. Felt was angry he didn't get the job and disdainful of Gray. Soon, in Felt's eyes, the president's men began treating the FBI hierarchy like hired help. He complained as well they were using him just like an errand boy. He'd get calls at home. That's right. And from low-level people asking for immediate information or action on something, and he, and he truly resented it. But that was helping you in a way that you didn't know at the time. That's exactly right, because the anger and the sense that uh, the Nixon White House was corrupt was very evident, laid out on the table for felt to see in a way that, of course, no one knew at the time. And the corruption became clear when Liddy's team of burglars was arrested at the Watergate building in June 1972. The FBI started to investigate. The White House started to cover up. And Nixon's new FBI director, Patrick Gray, went along with the cover-up. He was a guy who had no law enforcement experience whatsoever and turned out you know, to be so malleable that he would actually in involve himself in the cover-up. In the middle of the Watergate investigation, Patrick Gray actually took incriminating documents to his home and burned them. At first, White House tapes show Nixon Chief of Staff Bob Haldeman thought Felt would go along with the cover-up as well. Mark Felt wants to cooperate because he's ambitious. Yeah. Mark Felt, above all, you know, believed in the FBI, believed in the uh, integrity of the FBI. So what does Mark Felt do? I think he makes sure that this will not be suppressed by leaking material to Woodward uh, so that the public will be aware to some extent of what is going on. Mark Felt became deep throat. While Patrick Gray himself believed it was dying day that Felt leaked to Woodward because he was angry he didn't get the top job at the FBI, Ben Bradley thinks it wasn't that simple. Obviously, he wanted that story out or he wouldn't have talked to Woodward. He wanted to shine a light into that dark corner. But psychologically, the relationship is changing a little bit here as well, isn't it? There's very little time to talk about your career or how he's doing or whatever. That's for sure. Uh, no career discussion at this point. We are in uh, you know, the big casino. As the Nixon team furiously tried to cover up their crimes, they kept reading about them day after day in the Washington Post. My superiors were uh, going ballistic at times with the fact that what appeared to be direct FBI information was appearing in, in uh, Woodward and Bernstein stories. A lot of people think Nixon was paranoid over leaks. He was paranoid, but he had good reason to be paranoid, which almost changes the definition of the paranoia. The White House was desperate to know who was leaking, but Felt knew how to avoid detection. Moving a flower pot around, moving a newspaper, those are techniques that the CIA and the KGB use when they communicate with each other. And that's something that Mark Felt, being in counterintelligence, would have been totally familiar with. Six months after the Watergate break-in, Nixon Chief of Staff Bob Haldeman told the president he believed he knew who the leaker was. But they were reluctant to go after Mark Felt because he knew too much. It also helped that Mark Felt, now Deep Throat, was in a perfect position to cover up his leaks. FBI memos from the Watergate era show that when Nixon's men demanded the FBI find out who was leaking to the newspapers, Felt himself oversaw that investigation. This is classic. They've done an investigation, and they say, oh, we discovered that Woodward talked to one of the prosecutors, Campbell, and has a, a source in the White House on this, and then notice what's written in, in, again, this very elegant, perfect penmanship. That penmanship 
that flamboyant initial belonged to none other than Mark Felt. Last page of attached memo here is the entire answer. This is for action, this is for information in this case. He's found the leakers. Right. <laughs> and there's the F. It's the case closed. It was a bit of genius double dealing. Uh, it shows how good he was at his craft. He was the ultimate agent. Yeah, he was really good at it. And you had no idea this was going on when you were talking to him? No, of course not. By the spring of 1973, the president's man had much more to worry about than catching Mark Felt. The whole Watergate cover-up was imploding. When federal judge John Sirica began handing out stiff prison sentences to the Watergate burglars, burglar James McCord buckled and started naming conspirators at the highest levels. Soon, Nixon's closest aides, H.R. Haldeman and John Ehrlichman, were forced to resign. White House counsel John Dean was fired. It was now a torrent of leaks, many leakers besides Deep Throat. MSNBC commentator Pat Buchanan was a Nixon speechwriter then. It was a very difficult job to defend, uh, to defend the president when you didn't know what was going to pop up in the paper from these sources, all of which were feeding the Post. Inside the White House, President Nixon himself was contemplating the word that Woodward and Bernstein had been so reluctant to use, impeachment. The Senate voted to hold televised hearings on Watergate. On the eve of the hearings, in the garage, Deep Throat told Woodward something genuinely frightening. He was really wrought up. He was uh, tighter than a drum. And this is when he said, the stakes are so high, everyone's life is in danger. Uh, there's wiretapping going on. You have no idea what these people will do. Uh, it really scared the bejesus out of me. Woodward and Bernstein went to see their boss, Ben Bradley, at home in the middle of the night. They woke him up to warn him that his house might be bugged. His life might be in danger. When you went back in the house at 4 o'clock in the morning, could you go back to sleep after hearing all that they had just told you about who was involved, the depth and the breadth of the White House involvement in this? I'm ashamed to say that I did. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, uh, there was nothing I could do about it at 4 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. So I, I went back. Ben says he went home and went back to sleep after all that. Boy, I didn't. He told us to go take a bath and get back to work. <laughs> but he was alarmed. He was, you know, where is the, there's not a frame of reference for something like this. They never found any evidence that Nixon's men had bugged the Washington Post. Deep Throat was not infallible. But he was right about this. At least some of the president's men thought the stakes were so high that murder was not out of the question. I said, look, I'm not going to talk. Um, but given the consequences, if I did talk, in that I could bring down the government of the United States, it would not surprise me if someone decided to take me out. I said, now, if that decision is taken, just tell me and I'll go, you know, to some uh, lonely street corner someplace where you can get the job done there because I did not want somebody sticking a 12-gauge shotgun through the kitchen window and they take out not only me, but Mrs. Liddy and a couple of my kids. The committee will come to order. The Senate Watergate hearings open on May 17, 1973. John Dean was a cool, methodical witness against his old boss. I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency. Campaign it was a form of reality television that America had never seen before. Presidential historian Michael Beschloss. Everyone was absolutely glued. It's a cliche, but you know, you'd see people standing on the street looking through the window in which there was a television store and watching all these TV screens. It was a moment like that, but the moment lasted for months. I learned from early. One of the lawyers on the Republican side was Fred Thompson. The room was full, and the uh, there was blinds outside the door and uh, down the steps, and 
and later on out into the streets, winding on down around the block. So this was, uh, we realized that we weren't in Kansas anymore. The secretary's people would be... Thompson went on to careers as a U.S. The, senator. The nation could use a double dose of whatever God's got on special today. And an actor in movies and television. You were asked to respond But in 1973, he was a little-known federal prosecutor from Tennessee, catapulted into a situation without precedent in American history. They should be well thought out. I had my uh, certificate of appointment uh, signed by Honorable John Mitchell as Attorney General at that time, appointing me as Assistant U.S. Attorney. He was my boss and one of my heroes, you know, as Attorney General of the United States of America. But uh, I certainly never... Uh, Never thought I'd get a chance to meet him, uh, but I certainly never thought I'd meet him under the circumstances in which I did. And that was sitting across a narrow table, interviewing him, interrogating him privately. But his hand was shaking so badly that uh, he could hardly hold his pipe in his hand. A tragic, broken figure having to answer my questions with the specter of you know, going to jail hanging over his head. And if that's not a sobering experience for a young person, uh, I don't know what would be. It was Thompson who later asked the question that brought out one of the most astonishing revelations of the Watergate hearings. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I was aware of listening devices. Yes, sir. That meant there were tapes of the most sensitive and potentially the most incriminating conversations about Watergate. By then, Leonard Garment was counsel to the president. The tapes were dynamite uh, with a fuse burning and ready to go off, and ultimately did go off. Only a few people knew what was on those tapes. In one of his most important leaks, Deep Throat revealed something that would help destroy Nixon's credibility. We had a very important meeting in November of 73. Mark Feld in the underground garage says there is tampering with the tapes. There's some erasures. The Washington Post reported it. The White House denied it. This totally is untrue. This can't be true. This is, you know, off the charts. How dare you? And then a couple of days later, and they announced the 18 and a half minute gap. In a convoluted, complicated case, everyone could understand this. If someone erased an incriminating tape, then the cover-up was for real. Fine. Uh, the White House claimed the president's secretary, Rosemary Woods, accidentally erased that tape and released this photograph claiming to show how she might have done it. The photograph became a national joke. The Rosemary stretch. The clock was ticking on the Nixon presidency. Woodward and Bernstein began to write their first book on Watergate, All the President's Men. Some of their previously anonymous sources agreed to be named. Was it time to tell the world the identity of their key source, Deep Throat? By now, Mark Felt was retired from the FBI. Maybe he would come forward. Did you say to Mark, I really want to write your name, I want to tell everyone? Yeah, you're out of the FBI, come on, let's... Uh, tell this story. You should feel good about it. And it was, no, are you crazy out of your mind? He just said uh, flat out, no, no, no. The book came out in April 1974 as the Watergate crisis was heading toward a dramatic climax. It was the first time that Mark Felt learned of his colorful nickname. In the book, Woodward also described in detail how and where they met and the nature of the critical information that Felt had provided. There it all is laid out, Flower Pot, New York Times, Underground Garage. Suddenly, everyone was consumed with the guessing game. Who was Bob Woodward's secret source? Who was Deep Throat? I was listening to the local radio station here. They devoted 10 or 15 minutes to reading excerpts about the meetings with Deep Throat. Soon thereafter, I called Mark Feld at home. The worst thing happened. He hung up. And it was just like a, a stab. Woodward thought Felt was personally insulted. 
you know, here, number two in the FBI, exalted position, but he all of a sudden in this book, which was getting a great amount of attention, is known as Deep Throat, one of the most celebrated pornographic movies of the era. I wouldn't want to be known as Deep Throat, frankly, in that sense. By 1974, the Nixon White House was a bunker where the president and what was left of his loyal staff were holed up and holding out against wave after wave of bad news. White House counsel John Dean had pleaded guilty to conspiracy to obstruct justice and he was headed for prison. Many of the president's top aides were indicted on felony charges and later sent to prison. Aye. In the House Judiciary Committee, Republicans joined Democrats in voting for articles of impeachment. And in a unanimous ruling, the Supreme Court delivered the coup de grace, ordering the president to give up the remaining White House tapes. The president had no choice, and one tape clearly showed that Richard Nixon ordered a cover-up of the Watergate investigation. It all started spilling out. The wiretaps, the break-ins, the dirty tricks, and the massive cover-up orchestrated from the Oval Office itself. This is the greatest abuse of power that we have ever seen of any president and anyone really in American history. Days later, Richard Milhouse Nixon became the first American president forced to resign the office. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. It's an enormous relief in the country, in this town. Gerald Ford probably said it best. My fellow Americans, our long national nightmare is over. The next day. Did you want to dial Mark Felt? Yeah, I did, and I wanted to kind of talk it through, but the last I'd heard from him was the hang-up treatment. You didn't want to drive out there as you had before when you needed to have a meeting with him? Yeah, I, that's, I mean, I didn't need more information at that point. There was too much. So people looking in are going to say, wait a minute, he's done with him, he's, you know, he's used him up, he's gotten everything out of him. But I'm also trying to protect him, but I, I also am gutless. I so testify. By now, Woodward and Bernstein were household names and wealthy. Do you think that you would be Woodward and Bernstein today without Deep Throat? I think that we would be Woodward and Bernstein. I think that the uh, mythology would not be attached. You know, when we wrote the book, did we think that, that there'd be all this emphasis on Deep Throat? Hell no. We thought it would be about the process of this grubby reporting we did. Deep Throat also had an anonymous fame, but Mark Felt didn't want to cash in on it. Besides, he was soon in a lot of legal trouble. With J. Edgar Hoover gone and Nixon in disgrace, any past abuse of power became fair game. It was revealed that Felt had authorized so-called black bag jobs, burglaries carried out by the FBI to gather intelligence against members of the radical anti-war movement. Now Mark Felt, Deep Throat, was a suspect in a series of FBI-directed burglaries. He was going to be investigated for, of all things, authorizing break-ins. Mark Felt, Bob Woodward's compass and mentor during Watergate, was at a low point in his life. But you don't call him during that time no. in any personal way. Yet Woodward did call Phil to get a newspaper story about those FBI black bag jobs. He gave me an on-the-record interview saying, uh, oh, these burglaries were absolutely necessary. They were authorized. It was this time of peril and violence in America. But your relationship has changed at this point, Bob. It's a lot less personal than it was before. Oh, it sure is. Felt also defended the FBI in an interview with NBC News. He said the black bag jobs directed against members of a radical group called the Weather Underground were completely justified. His words resonate strongly today. The Weatherman fugitives are probably one of the most dangerous terrorist groups in the world. And uh, as you know, terrorism is probably the number one crime. And I, I think the agents felt uh, that it was uh, serious enough to warrant the use of these techniques. In other words, they were willing to take the responsibility to try and prevent another bombing. Just as Mark felt the man was entering this very dark period of his life, Deep Throat, his alter ego, was at the peak of his celebrity, played powerfully by Hal Holbrook in the 1976 movie version of All the President's Men. Did he go see the movie? 
I don't know. You never I don't know. I him. never talked to him about that. See, you never asked a, him. What did you think of the movie? No, because we were not. Uh, you were not we, at a good stage at that we, point. We weren't. In real life, Bob Woodward met Deep Throat only about a half a dozen times in the garage, but the eerie and realistic garage scenes from All the President's Men are fixed in the memories of movie fans. The filmmakers had never seen the real garage. Woodward never showed anyone where it was until he took us there. 33 years ago, you're coming down here. It's the middle of the night. You're a young reporter, no cars here. Could you see him when you came in? Most of the time, you know, I think it's that pillar or this one, he would just be standing behind there. And so you come around and all of a sudden he appears. Okay, come on, that's gotta be a little frightening. It, it is a little frightening, but the whole thing is frightening. At night, it's so quiet. You're so alone. You realize that you've kind of given yourself over to a process that somebody else is controlling. And it, it's unnatural. From a screenwriting point, it was an amazing piece of material. Here's this young reporter. They were unknown. They're in their 20s. And he's got this assignation in a dark, dangerous garage with a guy with a weird name, nickname, and they're talking and he's telling them things that enable the story of bringing down the president. And what did it take for the young Bob Woodward to descend into that garage in the dark of night? Robert Redford thought about that as he prepared to play Woodward. Bob was a genuine gentleman and a man that was very concerned about well-being and dignity and so forth, but underneath that, was another person that was relentless, tenacious, almost savage in his pursuit of getting a story, particularly getting the truth. Redford says he was obsessed with getting every detail of the story right, just as he thought Woodward and Bernstein were obsessed with their newspaper stories. The film appeared to make the characters glamorous. Uh, that wasn't the intention to make them glamorous, just truthful, about hard work. It was really about hard work. And, and working harder than anybody else. The movie imprinted Deep Throat in the imagination of millions. Millions who wondered, who was this guy? Almost from the beginning, some people suspected Mark Felt. Mr. Felt, every Watergate freak in the country would think me remiss if I didn't ask you before we get into the rest of it. Are you Deep Throat? <laughs> I've denied it before and I'll deny it now, but it doesn't seem to do any good. Did you have a piece of the action, Mr. Felt? No. It was a national whodunit. Maybe it was Al Haig, Nixon's chief of staff in the final days. Maybe it was former Nixon speechwriter Pat Buchanan. Maybe it was Diane Sawyer, who worked in the White House in those days. Woodward had told only a few people the real identity of his source. He didn't tell his boss, Ben Bradley, until after Nixon resigned. That amazes me now, you wrote in your book, given the high stakes. I don't see how I settled for that and I would not settle for that now. I think I would have asked him sooner, uh, told him sooner that I needed to know. Uh, well, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it now seems even bigger than it was. Carl Bernstein knew almost from the beginning. My kids would play this game. They would say, Dad, if you're on your deathbed, will you tell me? And I, I'd say, yeah, I might, I might. Well, there are clues in All the President's Men. The first is that Woodward always referred to Deep Throat before he was christened Deep Throat as my friend. And the initials of my friend, MF, are the initials of Mark Felt. And that was very, that to me was a dead giveaway. Woodward sheepishly admits that he even put those initials, MF, in some of his notes. Not very good tradecraft on my part, uh, not being very careful. Would Nora Ephron tell? She sure tried. I was under no obligation to keep it a secret since no one had sworn me to secrecy. And I told, you know, anyone, absolutely anyone, a stranger on the street, I would have been absolutely happy to tell. I occasionally was asked when I gave a speech who Deep Throat was, and I always said, oh, I'm happy to tell you, and I told them all, and never, no one, no one believed me. Guessing the identity of Deep Throat may have become a parlor game to some, but keeping it secret was no game to Mark Felt. FBI historian Ron Kessler. 
Mark Feld had, had spent his whole life in the FBI, and he was very devoted to the FBI, to its ideals, and to be identified forever as the person who leaked to Woodward uh, simply would have, would have been very devastating to him, I think. The secret almost spilled out in 1976 when Felt landed in front of a federal grand jury. Stanley Pottinger was a prosecutor who questioned him. He said, I had so much business at the White House, some people thought I was deep throat. And a hand went up among the 23 grand jurors, and he turned to Felt and he said, were you? And Mark Felt says, said, was I what? He said, were you deep throat? And at that point, Felt flushed bright red. Then, Felt, under oath, answered no. Pottinger immediately knew that something was wrong. He says he approached Felt and spoke in a whisper the grand jurors could not hear. Mr. Felt, I have to remind you that you're still under oath, so you have to answer questions honestly uh, and truthfully. But on the other hand, I don't think that question is relevant to these proceedings. Uh, so if you'd like, I'll be happy to withdraw the question and your answer. It, it's your decision. He said, withdraw the question. Still flushed. If demeanor ever speaks as loudly as words, uh, he had acknowledged that he was deep throat. Later, Pottinger had lunch with his friend Bob Woodward and told him what had happened. He says Woodward stayed calm. My recollection is that Bob never gave an inch on acknowledging that deep throat was deep throat. Woodward I, remembers it differently. I mean, my lunch just about went on the table. He said you had a great poker face. Oh, boy, I did, not down here, not a poker stomach. But Stanley Pottinger never told anyone else what he knew, even a year later, when he and Woodward sat down to dinner at, of all places, the Kennedy Compound in Hyannisport, Massachusetts. Inevitably, at some point, the question came up. Jackie Kennedy turned to Bob Woodward and said, uh, so what about Deep Throat? Who is it? Are you going to tell us? It's the perfect time to tell your friends who it is. Pottinger's sitting next to him, and Pottinger again gets this kind of all-knowing, smug look on his face. And I said something to the effect of, well, Stanley thinks he knows, kind of as a test, maybe, but it was kind of, oh boy. And this is in an environment at the Kennedy dinner table where- Which is raucous. Raucous. And everybody's trying to, they're, they're trying to taunt you into saying something you don't want to. That's right, which they do all the time, and they're gonna learn who Deep Throat is. And, uh, and then uh, Stanley, shut up, didn't tell. And I'll be forever indebted to him. Remarkably, Stanley Pottinger kept the secret. And what of the secret man, the real deep throat? In 1980, he went on trial for authorizing FBI burglaries. And ironically, the key witness for his defense was former President Richard Nixon. You can't make this stuff up, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that, that, that's exactly right. And at one point, I call Feld, and he, and he points out that the Post had written an editorial saying he should go to jail, and Feld, with full justice, says, I'm getting more help from Richard Nixon than the Washington Post. What did you think when you read that? I just felt the word that comes to mind is ghoulish. Mark Felt was convicted of authorizing those FBI black bag jobs. That's a felony. That brought some satisfaction to White House aides who had been fingered by Felt. There is a, a degree of irony when you look at the fact that uh, Mark Felt uh, was distressed by Nixon's so-called abuses of power. Yet there were like nine instances where he authorized uh, surreptitious entry into relatives and friends of weatherman people. Felt went on to publish his own life story, The FBI Pyramid. Almost no one read it, but knowing what we know now, it does provide a window into his mind. On the dust cover, he allowed them to print Mark Felt, comma, who was rumored to be the famous informer Deep Throat. Yeah. He'd raise it himself and then deny it. In this book, he says flat out three different times, I was not the source of information for Woodward and Bernstein. I did not leak information. Right, and he never leaked to Woodward and Bernstein because Carl never met him. And so, you know, maybe there's some uh, twist in his mind of, well, I never leaked to both of them. I don't know. And, um, but, you know, the denial is very powerful.
Felt had taken a huge risk in talking to Bob Woodward. If he was found out, he could be disgraced, humiliated, and steeped as he was in the secrecy of his mentor, J. Edgar Hoover. It must have pained Felt to leak the Bureau's secrets to a newspaper man. So why did he do it? You know, I think he saw Nixon for what he was, somebody who was abusing the power. I think he wanted the facts out. I think he had contempt for Patrick Gray. And uh, as an old Nazi spy hunter in his early FBI days, I think he liked the game, the chase, the sense of taking immense risk. The question still remains, and I don't know that we'll ever get answered about what motivated the guy, but whatever it was, it happened. And I always felt that was the most important thing, that, well, look, it isn't who said what or who it was that was Deep Throat. That's all fun, but it's that he did it, and that Woodward Bernstein did it. As the years went by, Woodward still went to great lengths to protect Deep Throat's anonymity, even if it meant lying to a friend and a colleague. In 1981, Washington Post columnist Richard Cohen talked to Nora Ephron and became convinced that Felt was Deep Throat. He mentioned it to Woodward, who is now an editor at the Post. He comes to you and says, I'm going to write a column. It's Mark Felt. He's talked to Nora, Carl's ex-wife, who on her own had kind of put all this together. And you lied to him. Yeah, and I tried to discourage him. Richard is not easily discouraged, and he uh, says he's going to write it anyway, and I said, well, you wouldn't want to be wrong, W-R-O-N-G, and I lied to and protect my source. Cohen says he now understands that Bob Woodward had his reasons for lying. President Ronald Reagan had just pardoned Mark Felt. I thought Bob did the right thing in lying to me. It was a dramatic, critical moment for Mark Felt. I think if Reagan knew that he was deep throat, Reagan would not have pardoned him. Well, I feel very excited and just... After Felt's pardon, so another twist. Richard Nixon sent champagne to the very man who helped bring him down. By then, Felt had faded into obscurity. Woodward went on to write a string of nonfiction bestsellers based on his dogged reporting and his unmatched ability to get people at the highest levels of government to talk to him. He knows how much the mythology of Deep Throat, the ultimate secret source, helped his own career. Going around doing reporting on national security issues in the White House and the CIA and so forth, when you can go in and somebody knows you have a record of keeping confidences, that really helps. Uh, the other day, I went to interview somebody in a sensitive position at length. And he started the conversation by saying, well, my wife said if you'll protect Mark Felt for three decades, you'll probably protect me. Bob Woodward did not talk to Mark Felt for almost 20 years. The relationship that began with a chance meeting then became a kind of father-son relationship, then reached an excruciating intensity during Watergate, just withered. By 1999, however, the Who is Deep Throat game was back again as it was every few years. A Hartford newspaper reported that a son of Carl Bernstein and Nora Ephron years ago had told a friend at summer camp that Mark Felt was Deep Throat. I started thinking, you've got to get this story down. You need to see if there's some sort of kind of closure or reconciliation. So in 2000, uh, I went out to see him in Santa Rosa, California. And just showed up on the doorstep. It was reminiscent of the old days in the 1970s when Woodward would call on Felt at home. Only now, the roles were reversed. Woodward was a famous journalist riding in a chauffeured car. Felt was the unknown. Now an 86-year-old man with a fading memory, living in his daughter Joan's converted garage in California. Woodward was apprehensive as he knocked on their front door. Seeing him when he came up from the, uh, the basement, he was so physically able at that point. Still had that mantle of gray hair, still had that deep voice of command. I had a feeling of happiness, of kind of, uh, you know, we've been reunited. But he'd aged so much, Bob. Yeah, he'd aged. 
Bob Woodward recorded a conversation with Mark Felt remember that day, probing to see what Felt remembered. Remember back th in those years when we met and chatted and any? Well, I, th I think I remember the area and the time, but I don't remember specifically anything. Woodward soon yeah. found that Felt had no specific memories the about the Watergate era. The powerful Hoover protege, the mysterious source in the garage, the embattled G-man, all those people he had known were gone. You remember the Nixon period a little bit? Vaguely, but, it, but I still don't have any specific recollections from it. Do you remember when you met him, when you met Nixon? I can't remember. I met him, but I can't remember when it was. We'll never get to meet the deep throat that Woodward knew 35 years ago. We can only get a sense of his personality from artifacts that he left behind, like the photo on the jacket of Felt's memoir. He had a great sense of style, Bob. Look at this picture that he chose for himself. Know, right. That's like something out of a 40s Hollywood dossier of some kind. <laughs> Central casting. Yes. Or look at the way he signed off on those FBI memos. Again, that's right out of Central Casting. That is not an F that is made without some consciousness of its authority and power because it looks like a sword. Although by the time they were reunited, Felt seemed to have no memory of his historic role, Woodward believed that he was still obligated to protect Felt's secret. I thought, ooh, uh, how do we keep, keep that cork in the bottle in a way that's in his interest, so then I or in your interest as well, because you were writing a book about it, right? Yeah, well, the book is uh, the obligation to tell the story. If he was competent and wanted to write a book with me, I'd be all for that. Felt's daughter said her father might be suffering from dementia. So Woodward wrote the book and locked it away. Then on May 31st, 2005, almost 33 years after Watergate, Felt's family revealed the secret in Vanity Fair. Mark Felt was Deep Throat. My grandfather is pleased that he is being honored for his role as Deep Throat with his friend Bob Woodward. When I saw that picture of him in the doorstep, waving with that smile, it was almost as if three decades of problems and, you know, undertow and had just been washed away, and I felt you know, wow. How are you? Hi, how are you? Later that day, Woodward confirmed that Mark Felt was Deep Throat, the best kept secret in all of journalism, finally disclosed. But questions remain. Did Bob Woodward enrich himself at Mark Felt's expense? Felt says he'd like something too. I'll, I'll arrange to write a book or something and I'll collect all the money I can. Woodward and the Post have discussed ways that Felt might be compensated but there are so many obstacles. We can't start down that slippery slope in our business of paying pain sources. sources. You know, what Mark Felt and I were able to do is have one of the most clandestine, intimate reporter source relationships without crossing some line of money or ethics or obligations. Thank you, sir. Thank you. In the end, Felt's family signed book and movie deals reported a total close to a million dollars. Were you surprised by the enormous interest in it? Yes, but I hope that what it does is give another generation uh, a chance to understand what happens when there is a criminal conspiracy in the White House or a constitutional conspiracy led by a president of the United States. And also that, that it ends the periodic revisionism about what Watergate was. That we need to understand why this was a pivotal moment in our history and uh, how uh, we got by by the skin of our teeth. Robert Redford says he wonders if anyone really did learn from the history of Watergate. The Nixon administration was um, shamed, um, and um, they were indicted for lying. So lying was not only a crime, it, it was a shame. And when that was exposed, uh, they were out. Now, in the climate we're now in, lying, you wonder whether lying is the shame it once was, or it has the same moral relevance it once had, or is it now just a political necessity?
because there's so much of it going on. I mean, it's pretty transparent. It's not something I'm inventing. The truth about how we got into this war, the fact that to this day they're still maintaining there's a connection between Al-Qaeda and Iraq, which there is not. Uh, weapons of mass destruction. Some who worked in the Nixon White House still are angry at Mark Felt for leaking. Former Nixon speechwriter Pat Buchanan. I think he's a snake. He had broken his oath. He had dishonored his code to his fellow members of the FBI. And that's why he lied for 30 years about it. Bob Woodward still protects the source he called my friend. First of all, he'd done his job. Uh, he'd been right about Nixon. Uh, we had been right about Nixon. We had been careful. And when you start listening to the tapes and hear what's on the tapes, you realize that Mark Feld and the Washington Post and everyone involved in investigating Watergate understated the case, that there is this hate and anger and on the part of Nixon and abuse of government power and law-breaking that was unimaginable. His son says he was a hero. Um, do you think he was a hero? You know, I don't know what heroes are. And I wouldn't put label hero, no hero. I would say he's a man of immense courage. And should, you know, there come a moment when all of us get tested uh, should we display a, equivalent amount of courage, then we should feel pretty good about ourselves. In becoming Deep Throat, Mark Felt may have had any number of motives. Anger at not getting the top job at the FBI, or protecting the Bureau's integrity, or getting back at the Nixon men that he despised, or perhaps to defend the country from a president who was out of control. In defending himself against charges of FBI-sponsored burglary, Felt once quoted Thomas Jefferson, words that ironically the president's men might have used to justify their actions, or that a lifelong G-man might have used to justify breaking every rule in the book and leaking to a young reporter about the biggest political scandal in American history. A strict observance of the written law is doubtless one of the highest duties of a good citizen, but it is not the highest. The laws of necessity, of self-preservation, of saving our country when it is in danger are of higher obligation. To lose our country by a scrupulous adherence to the written raw law would be to lose law itself with life, liberty, and property, and all those who are enjoying them with us, thus sacrificing the end to the means. And this explains my situation exactly. 31 years ago this summer, 1974, the White House had a funereal air about it. Richard Nixon was just hanging on as president. By mid-August, he would be gone, brought down by his own paranoia and corruption of power. Would that have happened without Woodward and Bernstein, the Washington Post, and especially Deep Throat, Mark Felt, the secret man who told the secrets? That's another part of the endless Watergate guessing game. We don't know just as we don't know exactly what motivated Mark Felt to get so uniquely involved in exposing the abuses in the White House, or what led Richard Nixon to believe that he could get away with it.